All right, just giving you the uh, latest on that uh, Israel attack on Iran. It was the largest such attack on Israel's part in history ever. I've uh, never seen anything like it. Mick, thank you so much for being here. Israel has never conducted such a large-scale direct military attack on Iran. The IDF says it achieved its objectives. For the Israeli Air Force to travel over a thousand kilometers to operate with effective impunity for a few hours over Iranian airspace, to have complete air superiority and dominance over Iran, to target and take out the specific military sites they intended to, and then to return essentially unscathed is, again, unprecedented. And Morgan, it happened Saturday night local, but it was Friday night here. We all learned about it, uh, which means Donald Trump heard about it as well. And at his rally in Michigan, he made these comments about Kamala Harris. Take a listen. So, Israel is attacking. We got a war going on and she's out partying. At least we're working to make America great again. That's what we're doing. Kamala. Kamala. He's the worst president in the history of our country. She's the worst vice president in the history of our country. As six years ago, I had to Israel to do it. بزرگترین آرزوی من بوده از کودکی یعنی این همیشه بام بوده استراتژی انقلاب اسلامی هم محو و نابودی رژیم جلی صهیونیستی و ان شاء الله تو این راه به شهادت برسه with that iran has also confirmed that brigadier general abbas nilforasan deputy commander of the revolutionary guard for operations was killed in the israeli air strikes in beirut on friday This comes in as a huge victory for the Israeli Defense Forces. He was killed alongside Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah in an attack. A minute of silence was observed to pay homage to Nasrallah. But as soon as it was over, vitriol ensued. Despite this anger, experts say there is little point for Iran to go into an all-out war. There is no point because there's clearly a disproportion of force and above all, in the event of war between Israel and Iran, the United States will be forced to re-engage. A war the international community wishes to avoid. I love the way you, you laid out how things were under Trump when, with regard to this situation and that we're basically now sitting on a tinderbox. I think it's also interesting that, you know, as Kamala Harris in her last weeks is saying, Trump is Hitler. In the last weeks, I'm hearing more and more for Trump, from Trump and his team, including RFK Jr., saying, if you don't want World War III, you should vote for Donald Trump. And making this distinction between a party that is for war and, and a party that seeks peace. Right, right, Rachel. Now, think about what Trump did for Israel. You know, moved the, the capital to Jerusalem, has been a staunch supporter of the Israeli people, uh, has uh, called for peace throughout the region, uh, and did, and put his, you know, put money where the mouth is with, with the Abraham Accords and sending the dip diplomats over there and bridging this centuries-old hate and, and economic, building economic ties between uh, significant uh, country, Islamic countries, uh, that, that was, uh, you know, I was part of that when I performed the duties as undersecretary uh, for policy, and that was groundbreaking, and, and it was really uh, promising uh, to have this new hope building in the region, all led by President Trump and, and Jared Kushner and, and that team. It, it was just unbelievable progress, and it was all undone by Harris and Biden on day one when they came in. And, and uh, the, the rather incompetent national security team that they've got in place. Where do you see this going? If Iran plans, and I'm, I'm just taking it from their foreign minister, that it's looking at some calculated response. To your point, Israel was responding to that missile attack back on October 1st. But this is what I see happening, a new pattern here, um, where it never ends because there's a response to the response and then a response to that response unending.
And I think that's the whole point, right? Uh, I think if the, we have an induction uh, that's coming up, if it goes one way, we're going to continue to see a never-ending uh, series of wars in the Middle East, in Europe, in Asia. That's what we've seen. It just continues to escalate and doesn't really, uh, there is, it, it never ends. Or it goes another way and perhaps it does come to an end because we start to dry up the money that's financing these wars and we stop to, to, to supply money into them. So, you know, it's, it's our strategy. We can do what we want with it. And either we're going to work to stabilize things or we're going to continue to have chaos like we do today. But they did hit a lot of significant military targets and Iran's uh, downplaying what they actually did. They hit IRG C uh, bases, they hit missile production facilities and launch facilities, and they also hit most of Iran's air and missile defense systems. So the S-400s and S-300s provided by Russia, which proved to be very ineffectual. So what this did essentially is leave Iran with very little air and missile defense. So if they retaliate, uh, to this strike, and it doesn't look like that is going to happen, but of course they make the ultimate decision. Then if Israel then responds, Iran's much more vulnerable than they were before last night. So this is a big shift, and it was significant. All right, unprecedented times. Mick Mulroy, thank you so much. So first of all, I wonder if we have entered now a new phase, because this is, is it not, the first time that Israel carries out a strike on Iran that it actually directly owns, unlike the strike on its consulate, which was attributed to Israel, unlike the strike on Iran in April that again was attributed to Israel. This time we've had a military spokesperson come out and own it directly. The latest is that the death toll of the army soldiers that were killed in the aftermath of the Israeli strikes in dawn has risen to four. And uh, we have no reports about the damage that Tehran has suffered. Uh, mostly, mostly air bases and military sites were targeted, uh, but we have, we have no reports regarding that. Uh, the official reaction and the rhetoric stays the same. Iran says it will respond to any military action conducted by Israel. And uh, with the death toll uh, going up, this uh, significantly increases Tehran's possibility to retaliate against Israel. Now, for, for the length of the attacks, and I believe almost four hours, it ended shortly before dawn in that region. Um, we're told that uh, they, they were really targeting these Iran Russian made S 300 air defense systems. Uh, but to your point, General, not going after uh, key military and or nuclear sites. Donald Trump had said uh, that, that that would be a mistake. What do you think? Absolutely. And I think there's something uh, more important that uh, point that Donald Trump made um, uh, in his podcast with Joe Rogan. He said, hey, look, Iran was broke. Iran was broke. And that was something that the United States did. So instead of being broke now, they are very wealthy. And oh, by the way, they were forced to they to we told the Chinese, if you buy a single barrel of oil from the Iranians, you will not be able to trade with the United States. And so Iran was isolated. They were broke. And then the Biden administration came in and turned it all off. So, you know, in addition to the things that I just noted, we've created the problem that Israel has to now go solve. Reading the, the official Iranian statements, which are emphasizing more that this attack did not succeed, is that an indication that perhaps Iran will not retaliate for this attack on its soil? Sami, I think Iran will react and respond to this. But the type of response will depend on the, you know, conclusion made today in Tehran. Uh, the initial assessment and the initial reaction here in Tehran indicates that maybe a serious or significant reaction, a direct reaction against Israel could be uh, not much likely. But I think a kind of reaction, even indirect one, will uh, come because this is part of it for that process. And uh, this is the matter of deterrence that the two sides have been trying to push to the limits uh, in order to redraw that line. And that's why I think Iran will try to respond. How do you deal with these nonstop onslaughts, not only from Iran, but all of its proxies and all of them together? Well, it has been a very tough year for us uh, in Israel since October 7th. Like you mentioned, thousands of rockets flying from all over. 
you know, you mentioned uh, Lebanon, but what about uh, Yemen, uh, Iraq, Syria? True. You have uh, militias, uh, Iranian militias that are uh, targeting us. But what happened in the last few weeks was, was a new paradigm. When Iran actually sent ballistic missiles from Iran into Israel, that's something we haven't seen in the past. That's why yesterday we had to, to send a message that uh, we will not accept it. Uh, and I, I tell you that we have nothing against the Iranian people. You know, we know that they are peaceful people. They are unfortunately have to suffer from the regime. But this regime is a hostile regime, a dangerous one. Uh, and look what they are capable of doing today in Lebanon, in Syria. They want to create chaos everywhere. It was very clear when Benjamin Netanyahu said they wouldn't be going after oil facilities. Maybe the fear there that it would lead to skyrocketing oil prices the world over, not just for, um, you know, damaged facilities in Iran. Uh, so the two things that would do the most harm to Iran, Israel didn't do. Well, I think it was very wise of Israel not to strike those facilities, number one, because the Biden administration in the world would have probably turned against Israel if they had done that. What they've done now is create the conditions that should Iran choose to respond, up the ante, expand the conflict, Israel is going to be able to justifiably go after those types of facilities to make sure. Because one of the things that Israel is trying to do right now, and what they did with the strikes last night, is try to reestablish deterrence. Here we are on the cusp of an election just 10 days what, what what does that mean for the Israelis, as certainly they're watching this very close American election that's playing out? Well, this is a part why I call it a tactical victory. For one thing, the war that Israel's fighting against Iran on seven different fronts is not does not appear to be abating whatsoever. And also, Israel did not change the, the nature of the regime by targeting, as you mentioned, those critical nuclear and oil sites. Uh, no, Israel's wars with the Iranian regime, not with the people. Taking out energy facilities would be, would be harmful, certainly, to the country and the people. The nuclear facilities is a different story. So, again, if Israel wants to up the ante to target, again, nuclear sites, energy facilities, also the regime, key personnel, and the IRGC forces themselves, they can certainly do that. But they've been withheld by the Biden-Harris administration from doing that, from changing the strategic balance in the region. If they are to respond now to, to Israel's attack pre, before the election, Israel would have to respond as well, whether that's before the election or after, obviously remains to be seen. But I think they're certainly calculating that, and they're hoping, I would argue, they're hoping for a Harris victory because President Trump was very forceful against uh, the Iranians. Daniel Fleisch, thank you very, very much.